Hello and welcome to this vignette on interactions in statistical models. We will be reviewing simple interactions between continuous variables and also including categorical variables. <clears throat> then we'll discuss how to model nonlinear associations either by transforming the data or by using a regression spline. There's a fine balance to deciding between transforming our data so that we can model it versus picking a better model to describe the data. I hope you'll understand this a little better by the end of this video. On one hand, we may need to transform the data so that we can fit a simple linear model to it. On the other hand, perhaps a simple linear, linear model just won't work, or maybe it doesn't make biological sense, and we're better served by fitting a much more complicated model that accounts for the nonlinearity in the data. And then finally, we will touch on non-parametric regression at the end. For this video, we'll be using a data set from the Rethinking Package put together by Richard McElrath on GitHub. Uh, it's linked down here at the bottom. <clears throat> this accompanies his book called Statistical Reasoning. Sorry, Statistical Rethinking. And the data set contains height and weight measurements for 554 individuals from the Kalahari Desert, and it's published by Nancy Howell in the late 1960s. As you can see here, we have height in centimeters, weight in kilograms, age in years, and the sex of the individual that we're sampling. I've added this sex label over here to make our uh, figures look a little nicer later on, but otherwise we wouldn't really need that. <clears throat> so if we're going to make a model to model weight using this data set, we might first want to look at a very simple model, modeling weight as a function of height and sex. If we look closer at the data, However, we see that we have children included in the sample and that there's a different pattern of, to the association for children than for adults. So down here we see people of young age that are still growing. <clears throat> when we look at height versus weight, we again see a different pattern for children than we do for adults. So these individuals who weigh very less are probably children and they have this different pattern than the adults do, a different pattern of association. So we either need to include terms in our model to account for this or just drop the children from our analysis. For now, we'll only include adults over the age of 20 in our model, but we will come back to this problem later. <clears throat> so weight is our primary outcome or dependent variable. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably. Beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 are our regression coefficients. Height and male are our predictors or our independent variables. And epsilon represents the error term or the variability in our sample. Um, and the I subscript is going to indicate a specific individual, a specific sample in our data set. So the error term for the ith sample, or the residual, as it's sometimes called, is going to be the difference between the predicted weight for the ith individual and their actual weight. Now the next question we might ask is, does sex affect the relationship between height and weight? If there were a difference in the association, we would see either a difference in the slopes of these two lines or a difference in their intercepts. <clears throat> Another thing that we we'll want to pay attention to is difference in weight by sex. Clearly males weigh more on average than females, but will this affect our model? Sex and height are also strongly correlated, which might violate our multicollinearity assumption. Including sex in the model might also not add a whole lot of information in addition to height. 
This figure makes it look like there might not be a difference between the two lines. In fact, I would guess that sex isn't going to add a whole lot of information that we couldn't infer already from height. But let's look at it a little more quantitatively and see if this intuition is true. So here we have our new model, including an interaction term between sex and height. Right down here, this beta 3. How do we interpret the coefficients for this model? So beta naught is the intercept, and technically it represents the weight for females who are zero centimeters tall. This doesn't seem to make much sense, but it makes our regression line fit the data better, so we include it in the model. This is also sometimes um, called the bias term, especially in um, machine learning applications. Beta one is the mean difference in weight for males compared to females at the intercept. So on average, males will weigh one or beta one kilograms more than females at the intercept. That is for individuals who are zero centimeters tall. Um, again, this is not doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it will make our model fit better. <clears throat> beta 2 is the slope of the line describing the change in female weight as height changes. So on average, when comparing a female with another female who is one centimeter shorter than she is, she will weigh beta 2 kilograms more than the shorter female, again on average. <clears throat> Beta 3 is our interaction term and it represents the difference in the slope for males compared to the slope of the line for females. So if beta 3 is greater than 0, then the slope associated with the change in weight as a function of height will be steeper for males than it is for females. When we fit this model, we see that the coefficients seem to be fairly small, especially beta 3. That's this one down here, the height male interaction term. Um, neither beta 2 nor beta 3 are statistically significant, so we'd probably want to drop them both from the model. But if we decided to include the sex-specific terms in this model, how would we interpret it? So the expected weight for females, in other words, when male is equal to zero, that's our dummy variable, is represented by this first equation. Because male is zero, beta two and beta three are going to cancel out. And we are left with negative 52.8 plus 0 0.633 times height. The expected weight for males in other words, when male is equal to 1, so weight given male equal to 1, is represented by the second equation. Because male is 1, we've substituted 1 in for male here. Um, beta 2 and beta 3 are added to beta naught and beta 1. So these terms can be combined. Beta 2 and beta naught can be combined here. Beta 3 and beta 1 are both multiplied by height, and we can combine those here. And we are left with negative 59.7 plus 0.59 times height. So that's the equation for our line for the expected weight of males. Now if we wanted to model the entire data set, rather than just analyzing data from individuals over the age of 20, we might try to fit an exponential curve to this data set. Looks like that might be sort of reasonable. <clears throat> the easiest way is to log transform the value for weight. So we can rerun the model using L weight, which is the log of weight here and we put that in the place of weight here in the model and we get our new coefficients 
Now these, opposed to the results in our previous model, appear to be statistically significant for the sex-specific results. So here this beta is statistically significant as well as the coefficient here for the height male interaction. So how do we interpret this model? These two equations describe predictions for our new model, but now we are predicting the log of the weight. So log of weight given male, log of weight female, male. So males from this population who are 145 centimeters tall, again these all add up the same as the previous one. So the expected weight for males who are 145 centimeters tall would be e raised to the 0 0.673 plus 0 0.02 to times 145, which is going to be 35.6 kilograms. Now when we check our mod regression assumptions, things don't look too terribly bad, but the results are slightly less normal than we would prefer, the residuals that is. Um, we can guess from this component residual plot that the problem probably comes in here with the interaction term. Um, when we regress a dummy variable for male times height against the residuals from a model without that term, we see a bit of a funky spread around that trend line here. Um, <clears throat> luckily for us, there is another option. When we, if we look at this figure again, you might notice that the data on the left of this vertical line appear to demonstrate a clear linear trend and the data on the right of the vertical line also appear to demonstrate a clear linear trend. Not just the same trend as the one, or just not the same trend as the one on the left of the line. So let's model these two lines using a first degree spline. The strategy is similar to adding the interaction term between sex and height in our last three models. We'll create a variable that modifies the slope and intercept starting about 125 centimeters. Up until 125 centimeters, there's no change in the slope. So height spline is going to be zero. That's our new variable that we're going to create. Once we move beyond 125 centimeters, however, the slope changes. So for every centimeter taller the individual is, we predict an extra little bit of weight for that individual. Um, if the beta for that new line was 0.5, then they, they would be an extra 0.5 kilograms heavier for every centimeter beyond this line. The value down here is 0.25, then the slope here would be 0.25 plus 0.5 would be 0.75. And we could in term, uh, we could include terms for sex as well, but we're not we're going to leave that out here for the sake of simplicity and clarity. So here we have our model and this runs off the edge, but if height is greater than not, then we get height minus 125, otherwise we get zero. Um, here's our model, our results here. So interpreting this, these equations, <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the expected weight, given that height is less than or equal to 125 centimeters, 
is represented on this first one. So again, because height or this spline term is going to be zero for all of the values in this equation, this beta two term is going to cancel out and we get negative 9.8 plus 0.247 times height. That's fairly simple. Now when we predict the expected value of weight given height greater than 125, we have beta naught plus beta one times height plus beta two times this thing over here. It's never gonna be zero because we're always greater than 125 here, so we will have height minus 125. We can distribute beta two into there and we have beta two times height minus beta two times 125. And then we can regroup those terms since this part here is a constant term. We'll put it over here with the intercept beta naught. And then these two terms here, we will pull together times height. And we get the new equation for the slope as, or for the line as negative 73.3 plus 0 0.755 times height. Now, as you may guess from this figure, we've got our predicted values along that line there. Um, the homoscedasticity assumption is going to be violated for this model. The variance changes a lot as weight increases. We're very close to the line along here, and then we become more variable up along here. Um, this is also going to cause major problems with our multivariate normal assumption. We essentially have two distributions of the error terms. One set of normally distributed errors about this line here, and one set of normally distributed error terms about this line here. <clears throat> so probably the best thing to do in this case would be to fit two separate regression lines on subsets of the data. We could split it at 125, 125 centimeters, as we tried to do with the linear spline, or we could just split it by age, as we discussed earlier in the video. It probably makes better sense biologically to split by age, so that's probably what I would do. Um, and the separate models will be much better behaved when you're looking at this. Now, up until now, we've just sort of eyeballed the breakpoint for this model. Um, if we want to let R pick the breakpoints that maximize the error in our predictions, or if we want to add sex back into the model without having to do a bunch of extra work, we can use the bSpline function from the splines package. So this formula here using the bSpline makes this nice looking figure here. So we're adding sex back into our equation. And then we tell it, make a break at 125 centimeters on a first degree spline, meaning we want straight lines, not quadratic or cubics. <clears throat> we could also make this change, the breakpoint here, 125 a little smoother which is probably more realistic we don't expect people to change that dramatically um, we do this using a higher order spline here we're using a cubic spline again with a knot at 125 centimeters so by default the BS function uses a cubic spline um, this knot at 125 tells R to fit a cubic spline cubic function here and another cubic function here. And uh, it has a constraint that they are continuous at a height of 125 centimeters. 
we can also use the degrees of freedom argument instead of explicitly specifying knots, and the knots will be chosen to minimize the error of the fit with higher degrees of freedom resulting in a wigglier line. So we have more knots. If we have higher degrees of freedom, we have more knots spread out through here. <coughs> now, if we take this to the extreme, we can get a very dynamic fit to our data. However, picking higher values for the degrees of freedom runs the risk of overfitting the data. So obviously, degrees of freedom of 20 here is probably a little on the high side. Uh, this will result in predictions that don't apply to the general population. We probably don't really believe that the relationship between height and weight changes quite like this with all these you know, wiggles and wobbles, especially up through here. Biologically, that is. Um, and also, this part of the model over here appears to be um, that drop there at the very end appears to drop down for no other reason than because of this one specific thin, tall man. Um, obviously, we don't want our entire model to be based on one particular individual. <laughs> now, you may have also noticed that the default output of the geom smooth function when we use ggplot is a nice smooth sort of moving average of our data. The default smoother used for data sets with less, less than a thousand observations is called low S and a generalized additive model is used with larger data sets. You won't get intercepts, slopes, and p-values from this but there are functions that you can use to do a non-parametric -para regression and give you predictions. And this can be a very valuable tool. Not only do you see what's going on in your data, but you can it can give you predictions using a locally best fit trend line that isn't constrained by a particular shape. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and have a great day.